Hey friends, Joey Resendis here. Um, so, time for a bass saxophone update. So, I've had the horn now about nine months, and, not, and admittedly, I haven't played it all that much um, because, I mean, let's face it, having a have a good working bass saxophone is kind of low on my priority, priority list, but um, it's something that I really wanted. So, um, here it is. So, immediately when I got it and I, and I started playing or tinkering it around with it. Um, I knew there were some things that I was going to want to uh, change, uh, both with the, I mean, with the feel and the mouthpiece and everything. So I kind of want to go over those things with you, um, what I've had done to it in in the last, uh, you know, few months. So um, let's see if I can remember them all. Goodness. So I actually changed the placement of a couple of keys. So the. Um, See if you can get in here. Uh, there we go. The um, fork F sharp key was really close, kind of over here to the pinky keys. So I had my repairman kind of move that key a little bit closer this way. It just felt really weird. So that was one thing. Um, the other key that I had um, that I kind of moved was the uh, the bis key. I'm gonna have to hold it up. So. One of the things that I really like um, that, that, were, that I want to make sure that all of my saxophones, not just this one, has is that when the bis key, when you're playing bis B flat, that the um, the um, those those two keys kind of go down in tandem, and when they go down, they um, they kind of stay level. You don't want your you don't want your um, your B key to be here and your bis to be here because it's going to feel weird. You kind of want those really, really um, level. So I had that key moved up a little bit because there was too much of a difference in the two keys. So I had them brought back up. On a side note, I played a um, I played a Collworth saxophone last week at the TMEA conference, and that had probably the best feeling uh, bis key of any saxophone I ever played. I was very surprised by it. Anyway. So, I had that done. Um, the upper octave pip, so the one on the neck. So on this horn, it's <laughs> it's right here. If you can see it open up right here. I'm not sure if you can see that. So I had my repairman put a splitter in that octave key pip, um, see if I can get a good shot of it for you. I'll tell you why here in a second. I have no idea if you're gonna be able to see this. So I, I don't know if you're gonna be able to tell, but in that octave hole, there's like a, a piece of metal that kind of splits the air that comes out. And the reason why he put it that there was um, anything A and above was very, very airy. Like you can hear it. I mean, it was just like really, really bad. And when you put that in there, that kind of took it away, which was really nice. Some of you might have that problem on your altos if you when when you um when you're going up in the upper, upper register and that neck octave key will come up. You might hear some air kind of bouncing off that pad and. A good fix sometimes with people will put like pantyhose. They'll tie pantyhose around that um, around the opening in your neck, the the neck pip, and kind of filters that air. And that kind of takes away that problem. And this was the solution for this uh, for this instrument. So really cool. Um, there was also a um, I don't even know what you call this. There is a little piece of um, rubber here on the bottom of this foot that was hitting this key, when it, that depresses this key when you're pressing the bis. And what happened was, um, or actually not when you press the bis, but it's when you push any, pretty much anything, um, it, when you're pushing the C key, there we go. And what would go on was that, um, that piece of uh, plastic or rubber was kind of acting like a suction cup, so when you would depress it, or when you lift it up rather, your C key, it kind of stuck there. 
And what my repairman did was he kind of rounded that out. So instead of a, he kind of made it um, concave instead of convex. Maybe I'm flipping those two terms around. Sorry if I am. But it's like a dome now. So that kind of took away that problem. Very nice. And let's see, other things. I think that was it as far as adjustments to the horn that, that I had made. Um, now the biggest thing that I did was I changed out that absolute piece of garbage mouthpiece that came with the horn. And I was playing a, um, I didn't have a bass saxophone mouthpiece at the time, but what I was using, I was using the, um, my baritone mouthpiece, so my, so my BL3 Optimum Van Doren. And so that worked pretty good of, of getting a better tone rather than the stock mouthpiece that I have that came with the horn. Um, but I wanted something a little bit better. I wanted an actual bass saxophone mouthpiece. So I ordered a Van Doren bass saxophone mouthpiece, which they do make that comes in one facing. It's just bass saxophone mouthpiece. There's none of this, you know, B27, you know, BL3. It's just bass saxophone mouthpiece. Here it is. That's what you get. And so that worked okay. Um, I actually kind of preferred my baritone mouthpiece on the on the bass saxophone. Then I, but I still wasn't really happy. So what I did was I ordered a uh, a Selmer bass saxophone mouthpiece. Well, actually, I actually bought it off eBay, and um, that's actually the mouthpiece I play on um, in my other video where I played the Fairling on the Selmer bass, and so. I got that mouthpiece and this is the one that, that's right here and that just made all the difference in the world. That was like the number one thing that, um, that kind of changed everything about the horn. Um, and I was, you know, I was, I was talking with one of my friends the other day and he was asking me what mouthpieces I play and everything. And I got to thinking on all my B-flat horns, my, um, my soprano, my tenor and my bass saxophone, I play Selmer mouthpieces. And on my E flat horns, sopranino, alto, and baritone, I play Van Dorn mouthpieces. So I'm an equal opportunity um, <laughs> player to those those uh, two um, companies right there as far as mouthpieces go. I just thought that was really funny. Anyway, um, so and there's still a couple of things, right? Really, not a couple of things, but um, I'm still tinkering around with. Um, with the horn to see how I can make it better. Not that it's horrible. The bass, the Selmer bass saxophone is not a perfect instrument. I don't think it, there's no uh, perfect, you know, bass saxophone. Um, and one of the things is I, I just haven't played it all that much, and I just need to practice on it because some things are hard that you know are going to get better with time as as I you know um, invest the time to get to know the horn better. Um, now, one of the things that was that was really hard um, at, at first was as going over the break as you go to from C, C sharp to D with the octave key those notes right there D like D sharp, E and F are a little bit of a challenge to to play if you're slurring up from a scale going up there it doesn't seem to be that big of a deal but if you're skipping like say if you're going from like an A to an E or a D with the octave key if you're going up, then it tend you tend to get a um, an upper harmonic. If you're not absolutely careful, you kind of really have to aim down. You have to have your voicing down, um, more open throat to make sure that those notes really come out. Um, and even then, it's still a little bit of a challenge. Now, one one of the things that I'm I haven't tinkered with yet is the um, the size of the body octave pip. Which, if you, if it's pretty wide, um, I, I had my, I had this at my repairman um, not too long ago, and he said that yeah, this is a very wide pip. So I'm gonna experiment with covering, um, you know, different percentages of that hole with tape, and see if that improves the response of those, um, those, those over the break notes, D, D sharp, E, and things like that. And if it does, then I can go over there and get a new octave pip uh, put into that body pit, and that will kind of alleviate some of those problems I've been having. So, um, with all that said, I'm going to play a little bit for you. Oh, yeah. And I 
also am order. I just ordered some actual. I've been playing on baritone sax or bar, Barry sax reeds um, for this whole time, and that could have been that. I mean, that very well could be one of the contributing factors of of, of the, some of the issues that I've been having with it. But I probably don't, I really don't think so. And I'm also ordering a um, a dedicated um, ligature for for this mouthpiece. And to be quite honest, the 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 difference between the Selmer um, C Star that I have and the Selmer bass saxophone, I'm sorry, it's the Selmer uh, Barry sax mouthpiece and the Selmer bass sax mouthpiece. I really think they're the same size. I think they're the same mouthpiece, the same blank. But the difference is that the bass saxophone is more hollowed out in the on the inside of the mouthpiece, and I think that's really kind of the main difference there. So I really think, um, and I and I ordered a Rovner. Um, Base saxophone ligature for this instrument, but I'm afraid it's going to be a little bit too big because um, I saw how I actually held one in my hand uh, last week at a conference, one of those ligatures, and it just looked ginormous. I think it was way, I think it's going to be too big for this mouthpiece, to be honest with you. Um, and it only comes in like a, a Rovner Dark, there's no Versa or anything like that, so. Um, when it comes in, I'll be able to see if that was the actual ligature that I need to, to buy. And I did also order bass saxophone reeds for the for this for, for this instrument. So um, let me just play a little bit for you guys. Oh yeah, and I have been using the peg a little bit. Um, so playing it to the side and resting the the peg on the floor does help a little bit. It kind of, um, if you try to hold to um, you know support the weight of the instrument with your with your right hand thumb rest down here the hook thumb rest I mean just doing it for a little while was starting to make my hand hurt so I did put the the peg on there which is very helpful so I hope I don't blow the speakers out on this little um, crappy camcorder that I have. <laughs> show you what I'm kind of thinking. So if I'm just playing a scale like that and going across that break, let me show you what I'm talking about. It, I think it's it's fine. There's just like a C major scale. So that's not really not that issue going over the break, but I think once you're jumping up to those notes, you can run into a little bit of problems. Like here's a G to a D. So I really have to really aim down on that D to make sure it comes up. It gets a little worse when you go up to an, uh, a D sharp's not D sharp and D are about the same. Once you get to E, I think it's a little bit more pronounced for problems. So, so it takes a little bit a little while for that note to settle in. Um, that was an E flat right there, and here's an E. That one's coming out pretty nice now. Maybe I'm just getting a little bit better at it, but if you're not careful, if you're too tight, you'll get something like I can't even make it do it now. Well, maybe I'm getting better. And the upper register is actually kind of nice to um you can it, it's not as strident as I thought it would be. So, I mean, really, as, as, as when I, as as I keep practicing this instrument, and I mean, j I'm just gonna keep it real. I'm not gonna be playing this thing, you know, all the time. But I do want to, you know have this saxophone in my arsenal. I'm gonna make more videos with it, um, whether it be etudes or, or maybe even solo stuff. I know there's a couple of, you know, bass sax sonatas out there. I know Walter Hartley wrote one. Maybe I'll play that for you guys. Um, but I do kind of want to uh, be able to play it um, maybe sometime in the Lone Star Wind Orchestra or something. I don't know. I usually play soprano in that group, so that might be a change. Maybe we're, we did an all um, Granger concert not uh, a few years ago and there was we had bass saxophone. But um, 
I'll probably end up loaning it to somebody. <laughs> um, and I also like to play it in church. I would like to play it in church too. I have a we have a church orchestra that that'd be um that'd be fun to play that. And they sometimes ask me to play. Usually I sing a little bit in church, but every now and again I play, I play saxophone in the in the, in the church orchestra. And I think this would be a, a good one to a good instrument to kind of shore up that low end of the of the ensemble. So um, anyway, so that's the that's the bass, and um, I'm really enjoying the horn more now that I've kind of had these. Um, these adjustments made to it and it's kind of taking its shape a little bit more into and kind of solidifying its, its place in my little saxophone family that I hope have over here so um, I'm not really sure what's next I kind of tossed around the idea of uh, uh, I showed my wife the picture of one of those um, contrabasses and she said nope absolutely not and I mean I would never be able to afford one of those but once you know one of those um those uh, Chinese companies, you know, makes a copy of one, you know, who knows? Uh, so, and you know, I've played this, obviously, if, you, if you've been watching my channel, I've played that Selmer bass um, for the Fairling Etude that I recorded a few years back, and you know, I have this bass now. And honestly, I mean, that Selmer bass, if you try to buy that today, I mean, you're looking at $25,000 plus tax. So you look, you're gonna be in, you know, um, over twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight thousand dollars, which is going to be cost prohibitive for most folks out there. Um, and this one, you know, I got it at a great deal through my through my work, um, and it was something you know pretty affordable as far as bass saxophones go. And you know, I would I rather have the Selmer bass saxophone? Of course I would, but that's not in the cards unless I find you know someone selling a, a really beat up used one or something like that or on you know, the very off chance that somebody's you know selling it and they don't know what they have um but um i mean this is a really great horn for for what i paid for it and i really think it's kind of like it's really 95 percent of of the horn that the selmer is rather and at about at a fraction of the cost at a at a um, man i don't really what would that be huh at a fifth of the cost of, of, of owning um, of the summer so I mean to me this was a no-brainer if, if you're gonna buy a bass saxophone I mean if you have all the money in the world sure the summer is a great option but if you like me and you don't and I think that's gonna be most people I mean this is a really really great alternative and it's really great and it's 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 not poorly made it's 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 there's some engineering go that went behind this thing so um, I'm pretty happy with it, and keep keep um, keep checking back with me. I'll I'll post some some updates and some maybe some performances of some some repertoire. So, anyways, thanks for watching, and uh, I'll catch you guys next time. Have a good day. Bye.